This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What's really happening in Venezuela? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer at Reason, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Daily Reason Roundup. Hi, Liz. Hey, Zach. Nicolas Maduro claimed victory in Venezuela's presidential election last week, but much of the rest of the world isn't buying it. Neither are many Venezuelans who've taken to the streets to protest what they say is a fraudulent election in the face of increasingly violent crackdowns and menacing threats from the Maduro regime. The opposition says its tallies show they won 67% of the vote. Official statements from the EU and the US State Department each say the evidence shows Maduro lost. Argentina's Javier Malay said minutes after polls closed, dictador Maduro afuera. Argentina is not going to recognize another fraud and hopes that the armed forces this time will defend democracy and the popular will. To help us understand how Venezuela ended up here and what might happen next, we've brought on two of our trusted Venezuelan analysts. Daniel DiMartino is a Venezuelan American who founded the Dissident Project and and is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Hey, Daniel. How's it going? Great. Uh, And Cesar Baez is our Reason colleague. He's a producer on the Reason TV team with me, and he writes about liberty in Latin America on his substack, Espacio de Libertad. Glad to have you on the show, Cesar. Thanks for having me. So let's bring up those results one more time. This is what was reported from, so the opposition party basically has compiled these results using digital records and saying that their candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, finished with 67, about 67% of the vote and Maduro got about 37% of the vote. Um, The opposition, uh, they, they say that's closer to reality than are the figures from Venezuela's National Electoral Council, which reported that Maduro won with 51% of the vote. Cesar, whose numbers should I believe and why? I think you need to believe the data and the evidence. And by now, all the evidence has been published by the opposition. The government hasn't published a single uh, voting tally receipt or anything close to like that. And, and this is probably the biggest electoral transparency operation that has happened in the region in history, uh, because basically the opposition is doing the government's work. Uh, so just to give some context, in Venezuela, we have an electronic voting system that was established in 2004. It was at the beginning a way that the government uh, decided to blind themselves or, or, or to help themselves uh, against uh, fraud committed by the opposition because they had a majority at the time. So they developed a very strong electoral system uh, that is not necessarily something that that, that we consider in Venezuela as, a, as something to be proud of. But this system prints an electron uh, voting tally receipt at the end of the day that uh, has a QR code and multiple uh, cryptographic systems to authenticate the results on each uh, polling uh, station. And the opposition managed to get to get more than 80% of the voting tally receipts. And everything is being published online. It's being verified by independent not surveys, observators, by the international press and even governments. So I think you should definitely believe the evidence. Could you tell me a little bit more about that evidence? Like how, how for instance, is the opposition party obtaining the, this information? Is it all open source? Um, you, you mentioned QR codes. Is it just they can go and scan a QR code somewhere and pull up the local results for a precinct and that's how they put this together? Like what what is the process for gathering that? No, I, I'd say that this is the result of a huge operation that involves, according to the opposition, more than 90,000 uh, uh, witnesses in each polling station and more than 600,000 volunteers nationwide. So basically, 
the government tries to keep all this electoral information for them. Uh, they tried everything they can. They try to intimidate the witnesses at the polling stations. They use violence. Uh, and they really tried to avoid the opposition from getting all these tally receipts. But uh, as reported by, for example, the Washington Post last week, the opposition developed this operation because they knew that the government was uh, going to make this big fraud or just announce f uh, fake results. So people did everything they can uh, to get the, the tallies. For example, they asked for the neighbors, for their friends to go to the polling stations where once the, uh, the, po the polling were, was closed. So they can help them basically avoid the military people, the paramilitary uh, people that are part of the uh, government. And they print these tallies, they put them uh, on books, they put these tallies on their underwear, crazy things we, we heard about this. <laughs> and that's basically the way that the opposition had these tallies that have been uh, afterwards, it's, it's scanned and published on this website called Resultados con BZLA. Com. So how, how trustworthy is that system of sussing out what the actual results are? So uh, it's pretty accurate in terms that the government created this to prevent a fraud against them. Uh, so I haven't heard about a single uh, incident of having that difference between these electronic receipts and the actual polling boxes, because at the end of the day, in every polling station nationwide, they open 51% of the polling boxes and they count manually each vote. And if there's any incident of, of a different counting, this is something that uh, it's, it's recorded. So I haven't heard a single uh, incident like that. I think it's pretty accurate that this is being verified by independent observers as well. So presumably the official election council, the the Maduro, Maduro government will release some sort of tally to validate what it says are the results. What do you predict? How do you predict that's going to be handled? Um, if you if you're saying that their results are fraudulent, what are they going? What do you think they're going to do to try to sell the idea that he won with a slim 51 percent majority of the vote? Well, they're going to use the Supreme Court for this because the electoral authority is basically not able to make this fraud, or this big fraud that just print uh, more than 30,000 voting tally sheets from like in, in a question, in a matter of weeks. Uh, so they're trying to use the Supreme Court kind of uh, the argument that if you're not agreeing with the electoral authority, just go to the judicial system and present your evidence. The problem is that the Venezuelan regime has decades co-opting the uh, justice system and the Supreme Court in particular, and they respond directly to Maduro. So they can just have this process open for weeks, months, or even years. There has been in the past some other uh, processes like this. For example, in 2016, some representatives from the opposition were not uh, possessed and in the, in the National Assembly. And this is still an open case to this day that the Supreme Court just rejects to, to advance in this process and does whatever Maduro wants. I, I should say too, um, you know, this is not an election system that is, that is invulnerable to cheating. They still cheat, even within the 30% of the vote that Maduro did get legitimately. Uh, it wasn't like a free and fair election within this. There's a lot of incidents of people being forced to vote for them in universities, in military barracks. There's people bribed to vote. There's people who went to vote on election day, and then when they went in, they told somebody already voted for you. So this is simply like this count of 67 to 30 is just recorded votes, not necessarily a free and fair election. Still, the real count is really much more than, than 67 to 30 against Major. Well, so is there any hope of once the so so what exactly is the game plan here? Like if if this gets to the Supreme Court and there's no real hope of them going against Maduro, you know, what exactly is the game plan here? Basically just for Gonzalez to make his case to an international audience to try to communicate just how corrupt, you know, Maduro is. And, yeah. and then Maduro will ultimately still remain in power. Like is that sort of the best possible case scenario here? 
Well, what right now is, is happening in the country is the opposition is holding basically weekly protests. They're already going to announce what's going to happen next. There can't really be in Venezuela today a national strike where every day people are in the streets. That's simply economically impossible because the population needs to be able to feed itself. Uh, that's one of the other negative consequences of the economic policies of this government is that the Venezuelan people really cannot afford to protest uh, constantly. And so uh, my guess is that what they're going to try to do is protest on the weekends like they've done so far and that they're going to announce to or, or ask for, for a new protest uh, next weekend um, and then see what happens. You know, they've tried to uh, ask the Venezuelan military to see if they, they can do the right thing, try to appeal to them through their families who are the, at the end are suffering too. I'm very skeptical of this strategy, uh, but that's the strategy that they're pursuing. To that point, Daniel, I want to play us a clip that's been circulating all over Twitter of the crazy violence that we're seeing and protests in the streets. Uh, you know, people are really, really incensed. John, would you play that? So pictures of Maduro being torn down, a statue being toppled. The, uh, the this uh, I've heard people saying this looks like, you know, the end of the the fall of the Soviet Union or something like that. Um, what are what uh, what does this say about the state of the Maduro regime, Daniel? Uh, well, I would say the the violence really has come is from the regime. Like, yeah, people are burning the face of Maduro in, in signs and they are toppling the statues of Hugo Chavez. But the regime is shooting at people and has killed 20 people so far, has arrested 2,000 others, is building torture camps as we speak, uh, where Maduro announced we'll, we'll send the protesters there. Um, and I think people are, are tired and, and, you know, enough of 20, a quarter of a century of the same government who took one of the richest countries in the world to one of the poorest has really changed people's minds, right? The question now is whether it's too late for them to change. I saw a video recently of this lady who was crying because she said that she used to support Chavez. And now she is having to live with these consequences and she feels terrible for having formed part of that movement. And you know what? I absolutely forgive those people. The question is if it's uh, too late for, for that to change things. You... Talk about how Maduro has been cracking down on all manner of dissent. Uh, we have a clip uh, where he's musing about re-education and labor camps for dissidents. John, can we roll that one? I have decided to create these two maximum security prisons for all the new generation gangs that are involved in violent protests and criminal attacks. And there will be no forgiveness or consideration within the framework of the Constitution within the framework of the laws. And how about making a bet to see if those maximum security prisons manage to re-educate and turn into productive farms that actually produce, that actually work. Like they did back in the day, they used to take them out to build roads, remember? Well, there are many roads to build, so they could go and build roads right. This is kind of a wild clip because, I mean, well, first of all, it's AI generated. This uh, Maduro is not speaking English in this address. Um, you know, we translated it to Spanish via this AI tool. But I mean, this is kind of just stunning. I mean, to an American audience, to a Venezuelan audience, this must seem, you know, very commonplace. But what are the types of dangers that exist for ordinary Venezuelans who are trying to protest in the streets? What is likely to happen to them? Yeah, you know, the, the Maduro regime set up even police checkpoints right now where they are detaining people and checking their social media activity on their phones. Uh, and those people are, are then arrested if, if they don't pay. You know, and, and you, you said they wouldn't be shocking to a Venezuelan audience. This one was actually shocking to me. I'm, I'm not sure if it was shocking to Cesar, but uh, we, we feel like this is descending very rapidly into, into you know, like a, a Stalinist uh, dictatorship, really. Uh, and so that that has really concerned me. It concerns me because we speak with people all the time, Cesar and I, with people in Venezuela. And and what happens if they see or or private messages? They will get arrested. And to add more context to that, uh, in 2014, Venezuela uh, 
was in a very high intense cycle of protests at the same time that, for example, the Euromaidan protests were happening in Ukraine and everyone got their, everyone got their news about what was happening in Venezuela. But in the whole year, in 2014, we had 3,000 uh, people getting detained because of protests. In just one week, last week in Venezuela, we have more than 2,000. So that tells a lot about the intensity of repression right now. And I think the most important uh, uh, point about this is that Chavismo lost the support of the popular bases in Venezuela. Uh, they used to sell themselves as these mass movements that were helping working class people. Uh, but the poorest in Venezuela are the ones that are going to, to protest right now. And I think that's been that's a big shock for Maduro. And that's why uh, his response is this, talking about getting people in jail and put them to, to build roads. And that's something that we only saw in Venezuela in the worst dictatorships that we have, the military dictatorships in the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, it sounds like he's talking about penal colonies being created and putting a significant share of the population in those. I mean, in recent years alone, we've seen, what, like 8 million people flee Venezuela. For those who are currently protesting against the government, say they do fear for their lives, what's their path to get out of the country? And what are you hearing from people on the ground? Yeah, uh, at least I am hearing from a lot of people that they're getting ready to leave Venezuela. They are waiting for things to calm down. Uh, you know, most flights have been suspended out of the country because Maduro brought relations with a lot of Latin American countries, and that included even breaking flight routes. So there are no flights anymore to Panama, which was very popular, no flights to the Dominican Republic, another very popular route to leave Venezuela. Now it's basically only Colombia, and I'm not even sure if Brazil <laughs> flights are still happening. Or, were you saying something, Cesar, that with flights? Yeah, and, and regarding that point, we just got news that in the last week, the Venezuelan government canceled something like 20,000 passports uh, for yeah. journalists, activists, they a lot of people that have nothing to do with politics, even people that fly, uh, went to Venezuela just for the elections. Uh, they're, they're trying to keep a lot of people in the country. They're putting people in jail. They are trying to catch their flights from Caracas to somewhere else in the world. Uh, even people that we're not living in Venezuela anymore, that they are doing their their lives in, in, in other countries throughout the world. So they, uh, I, I think this is the worst phase that we have ever seen uh, from Maduro, which is a lot to say because he did a lot of nasty stuff in the past. <laughs> yeah, say so if you want to leave, you have to remember also Venezuela, you know, and this is a little funny too. They used to tell us Venezuela will never become like Cuba because we have oil, we're a democracy, but we're also an island, we're not an island. And in, that's the one thing they got right. We're not an island. And because we're not an island, people can actually live by land illegally to Colombia. And that's what I expect will keep happening. Uh, at the end, you know, this is a Latin American uh, socialist regime, not a nation socialist regime, which means that you can bribe your way out. Uh, uh, Daniel, you just muted yourself. On oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is a Latin American regime, so you can really bribe your way out. Well, I, so Cesar, you mentioned that the people have turned against Chavismo, that there was popular support for Chavez at some point, presumably, and at some point, presumably before this election, it something turned. Um, I'm curious when that turning point was, um, you know, and you, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from both of you actually about uh, your personal experiences a little bit leaving Venezuela and what you saw in kind of the public mood as you were leaving the country. Well, in my perspective, this has been a progressive uh, a phenomenon because uh, especially after Chavez died in 2012, I think that uh, the sorry, 2013, the, the Venezuelan people started to, to realize that the country was going into the wrong direction, especially because of the scale of repression at those points, especially in 2014, in 2017. And as the economic situation has been deteriorating as well. And this is not because Maduro did something different than Chavez. Maduro kept every policy that Chavez stated in the beginning. So I'd say the scale of repression, uh, big people are getting tired 
of not having electricity on their houses or not having enough uh, money to buy food or even not finding food at all in grocery stores. Uh, that, that's a phenomenon that impacts especially the working class in Venezuela. And it's a progressive phenomenon that we have seen in, in, the, in the last years. But I think people didn't have they had in the past a real chance to express express themselves, especially in, in, in the ballot boxes. So this is a big turning point because the, the Venezuelan people had a chance to express how tired they are about the current situation, about the current state of things. So that's why we suddenly have something like 80% of the population going against the government because they can't stand the situation anymore. Yeah, and, and I would say that this regime hasn't had majority support for well over a decade. Uh, I mean, they have been in power since 1999. Chavez def did get legitimately elected in a free and fair election and in December of 1998. Then he rewrote the constitution. There was a general election in 2000 that, that he won. But ever since, there's been increasingly election fraud. And with election fraud, I mean dead people voting. I mean uh, forcing people to vote, bribing them to vote. If you win an election under those conditions, sure, you, you, you win an election, but that's not a legitimate win. Now, we never had 80% opposition against Chavez until recently. That is true, at least until, you know, 2017, that it wasn't 80%. But it has been majority opposition for a very long time. Um, the, you know, people have been protesting for a very long time. The, the mass protests of 2002 were, were huge. There was a coup attempt against Chavez that unfortunately failed. Um, and as a consequence, we are where we are today in a country that, that is obliterated. This is a little far afield, but I'm really curious um, to hear from both of you. We're talking about legitimately, you know, consistently stolen elections, elections that are simply not free and fair. Now that this has become a little bit of an earworm, a little bit of a talking point, a little bit of a thing that won't go away in U.S. politics, mm. what's your like, you know, not your intellectual reaction, but like what's your more visceral reaction when you see this happen and, and permeate our political culture here? You know, when when I post things now about the Venezuelan election, it's really funny. I get people on both sides uh, commenting, MAGA people saying, and this is how Kamala is going to turn uh, American to Venezuela in four years and it's going to be a communist dictatorship. And then uh, Democrats saying Trump is going to turn us into a dictatorship but not recognize the election results. And everybody says this is the fraud that's going on here, both sides. And, and to me, it's funny because I, I don't think that's what's happening here, uh, election wise, at least. Uh, I think people I, I think it's good that people are concerned about election integrity. And we certainly have a lot to, to learn and improve. And I think steps in that direction are good. And, you know, voter ID, all these things, I think a lot of things can be improved and should be in the U.S. But I don't think that, you know, they're doing election fraud like Venezuela or that they, they ever have here. Yeah, when, when I mentioned that we have a pretty robust electoral system, that's something that I'm not very proud of. Because that happens uh, as a response of political forces trying to actively commit electoral fraud in Venezuela, like a widespread electoral fraud. So when I explain how the electoral system works and, and how the opposition right now has these incredible tools to prove that they won. Uh, I don't want to send a, me a message that the U.S. should adopt something that like we have in Venezuela. Because for us, having this elector uh, electronic electoral system has been a nightmare. A lot of people distrust the system, even though uh, it's our evidence that we want right now. And, and this is because uh, people just like lost their faith on the political institutions, on, on respect for democracy, for transparency, to open dialogue of ideas. And that's something that I fear uh, for the U.S., but that's definitely not the situation right now. Uh, I don't think there is like this widespread uh, intention of manipulating the elections or, or big cases of electoral fraud. Probably the opposite have been proven in courts here in the U.S. I really like actually for Venezuela to just have a regular electoral system with, you know, not not demanding of people to go to uh, these polling stations on a certain day where violence can erupt. Uh, they could get intimidated by, by paramilitary groups. I don't know. I, I think it's just not working for us. And, and at the end, this is the uh, consequence of having an authoritarian regime like the one we have. And I'm not proud of that. Yeah, no. It's hard to see where 
where that ends. Um, I mean, you've got uh, the main opposition leader was not even, uh, uh, Mar Maria Karina Machado was not even allowed to run in the election. Um, she very quickly after it was clear there was something wrong with this election, gave a big, gave several big speeches outlining what she thinks should, what she thinks happened and what she thinks should happen next. I want to talk a little bit about that with both of you. First, let's roll the clip from Maria Karina Machado, the opposition leader, um, and uh, Edmundo Gonzalez uh, Urutia, who was the, the opposition candidate, talking about the nature of the fraud in the election. John, can you roll that, please? Venezuelans and the whole world. Venezuela has a new president-elect, and it is Edmundo Gonzalez. We have won in all sectors of the country, in all strata of the country, in all states of the country, in all. I won. Here, all the rules have been violated to the point that most of the records have not yet been delivered. Our struggle continues, and we will not rest until the will of the people of Venezuela is respected. Uh, and once again, that, of course, is translated with Hey Gen AI, um, and we'll have links to all the original videos uh, in the description. We're just doing that for our English speaking audience. Um, you know, on Monday, they uh, Maria uh, Karina Machado posted this to her Twitter account, her ex account. Um, saying Venezuelans, military citizens, and police officials, our message at this decisive hour for the future of the Republic. And then she attached a letter, which I've also uh, translated. Um, she said, Venezuela and the entire world know that in the elections of last July 28th, our victory was overwhelming. We obtained 67% of the votes, while Maduro obtained 30%. That is the expression of the popular will. However, Maduro refuses to recognize that he was defeated by the entire country in the face of legitimate protest. He has launched a brutal offensive. We call on the conscience of the military and police to place themselves on the side of the people and their own families. Uh, and finally, we ask all of you Venezuelans who have mothers, fathers, children, siblings, who are members of the National Armed Forces or public officials who demand they do not repress, that they don't recognize the illegal orders, that they recognize popular sovereignty expressed in the vote, uh, and that the new government of this republic, democratically elected by the Venezuelan people, offer guarantee will offer guarantees to those who fulfill their constitutional duties. Likewise, it emphasizes that there will be no impunity. Um, the proclamation of Edmundo Gonzalez Urutia as president-elect of the Republic is hereby granted immediately. So that seems to be calling for a military overthrow. Is that accurate? And how likely is that to happen, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously what she is calling for. She she wants the military to, to turn uh, on the regime. Uh, oh. I, I think it's extremely unlikely. Every military official who uh, refuses even to kill or to repress protesters is punished. Some of them are tortured. That's what happens to them. The Cuban uh, intelligence are, is in Venezuela tapping the communications of everybody who's part of the security apparatus, not just military, but police, local, national. They have paramilitary groups that are not part of any of this. They have intelligence agents that go home to home to look for the protesters. I've seen the videos. These are people who enjoy what they do. In my opinion, they are monsters. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that a large portion, perhaps even a majority of the rank and file, uh, low level military um, components of, of the Venezuelan armed forces are against Maduro and they probably voted against him. Yet, what are they going to do? Uh, they are going to stick their hand up and say, I won't repress the protest. They can't organize. And when they do that and when they stick their heads out, they are going to be punished and perhaps killed. So the... We are unfortunately, in game theory terms, we're in a Nash equilibrium, and the Nash equilibrium is that the regime stays in power, and we need something external to break that. Hmm. I, I, you agree I, with that, Cesar? I, yeah, I'll have to disagree with Daniel on this, because uh, two things. First, I will not say that Maria Corina Machado is calling for an overthrow of the regime. 
in the sense that uh, the regime is in power because the military are uh, following the orders of repression. They just need to stop following these orders. We don't need a military operation to go to Miraflores and get Maduro out of power. That will happen itself when the military stops the repression, just as it happened in so many other authoritarian regimes in history. And for example, uh, Ivan Núñez, a Chilean journalist that uh, was in Venezuela for the elections, uh, last week he reported that uh, he went to a, a military barrack where they have a polling uh, station and the members of the military told him that uh, 4,000 military uh, people from the military voted there. At the end of the day, we got the results from that polling station and the results were that something like 3,000 uh, votes went to the opposition. So that means that there's a majority of people, even in the military, that understands that the situation needs to change. I agree with Daniel that there is not a strong in incentive uh, for these people to just uh, rebel against the, against the repression orders. But at the same time, uh, I need to recognize that some reporters like Orlando Avendaño uh, have reported that in the last week, more than 100 uh, members of the military have been detained uh, in the context of refusing to repress. Uh, even we have information from people uh, from the judiciary system that have been detained for the same thing, for not processing uh, peaceful protesters as terrorists, just as some other ones. So I think this is already happening. Uh, and it will be inaccurate to say that this uh, break between the government and the military is not happening at all. No, I think it's happening, but it's not the definitive break that we're hoping for. But it's definitely well, happening well, right now. How, the, the thing is that it can't happen because, as you say, they get detained then the other people see they get detained and they're not going to risk their lives. I mean, people will prioritize their own lives over, over those of others, their own families that are at risk. And maybe they won't want to torture people. I can assure you. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but that's why I didn't join the Venezuelan military. So there's a, sel a selection effect. If you don't want to do this job, then you are not becoming uh, a member of these organizations. We have to understand that there was already an attempt to do a military coup against Chavez in 2002. Uh, it failed. And after that failed, Chavez purged the whole military, with, packed it with his own loyalists. And now it's been, since 2002, 22 years, a whole generation. There are people who were born after the coup attempt who are now part of the military torturing people who are 22 years old, right? Perfect. That's military age. So what we're talking about here is a new generation that they have raised, a military that they have indoctrinated, and even if they disagree, they get caught, they get repressed. I, I just don't see how this happens. I think the evidence so far of 25 years shows that this doesn't happen. There was an attempt by Oscar Perez. You know, Cesar knows him. Uh, this was back in, uh, was this 2014 or 2017, Cesar? Oscar Perez, 20, um, in 2018. Yeah. It, it, right. And he attempted, he was a member of the intelligence community. He got together a few people. Um, and what the regime did, he, he took a helicopter, he even tried to bomb the Supreme Court, and they, they found him. And when he even give, gave himself up and gave him his weapons away, they just killed everybody immediately in, in broad daylight. So when you're saying that, Daniel, if you believe that ex when you say external forces would need to get involved to actually make any sort of difference in the situation to dislodge the Maduro regime? Are you talking about United States intervention? Are you talking about UN? What, uh, is there something else? What, what, and is that a good idea? Yeah, well, I think um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is what I believe is just a fact, not necessarily a, a prescription. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't think that this is going to happen in any other way. Otherwise, it's just not going to change the status quo in Venezuela. Um, and when I mean, you know, things that could threaten the regime, when you mean something I advocate that I think would be relatively easy, would be to do the opposite of what the Biden administration has been doing, which is to release the people that were part of the regime that were arrested in, Venice, uh, from, uh, in the U.S. We had the nephews of Maduro in jail in New York. We had a terrorist financier. We still have a few generals, uh, among them El Pollo, um, that's his nickname. Uh, by the way, I went to his first hearing in New York City in the Southern District of New York, and I saw him firsthand. Uh, these are the people that we need to keep catching, not just in the U.S., but in Europe. The children 
and I, I'm not sure if the wife too, of the Minister of Defense of Venezuela live in Spain. We need to be catching a lot of people, a lot of their financial partners who are still profiting from what's happening in Venezuela and use them as leverage. You use them to get the people in the Venezuelan regime to betray each other. At the end, everybody there is there not because of a collective project, but because of self-interest. I would say that uh, I disagree again because uh, the maximum pressure approach to Venezuela, like the one that the Trump administration did, sadly didn't get any actual difference on, on our struggle. Uh, for example, sanctions, uh, actions like releasing Alex Saab, uh, for example, uh, that this happened under on the, on the Biden administration, uh, ironically had been presented us with this opportunity to regain freedom through elections. Not because we believe that we have free and fair elections, that's not the case at all, but we're opening spaces for the Maduro regime to commit these errors. I, I think if they did their calculations better, they knew that there's no way that they could have won the elections. So it was easier for them to just don't do it, do them. But for example, the international community or the US in particular presented them with the opportunity negotiating like, hey, we're going to lift sanctions. We're going to send you this guy, Alex Saab, that we are processing at his a frontman. We know that he has a lot of information. So we're going to send that back. Just let the opposition run primaries, select a candidate, then have presidential elections, whatever the conditions are for that. And ironically, not putting all the, this immense force and pressure on the, under the Maduro regime, they committed these mistakes. And now- so, so, Sorry, oh, but that's not what the agreement said. That's not what the Barbados agreement was about. The agreement was not in exchange of just holding elections. The agreement was for holding elections with free conditions, not with any condition. The agreement was to allow Maria Corina to run. The agreement was to release political prisoners. And the Maduro regime didn't comply with a single point in the agreement and the U.S. lifted all sanctions, released the nephews of the dictator, released Alex Saab, and didn't get anything in exchange. You say it was a mistake, yet they're still in power. So who committed the mistake? They're still in power because they're killing people right now, because they're torturing people right now, not because That's they're right. lifting sanctions or sending political uh, or, or people politically connected with the regime. Sure, but then their agreement failed. I mean, the point of the agreement was to have free and fair elections, which we didn't have. And Maduro, in exchange, got his own nephews, got a terrorist financier, and billions of dollars in oil revenue that he uses, among other things, to buy weapons to kill people in Venezuela. Yeah, but we have the chance to uh, participate in these elections that were not free and fair elections. They, they have never canceled any election in Venezuela. Like, this is not a, a giveaway that they give to the U.S. It's not like they weren't going to hold elections. This regime, yes. if, if they're good at something, is a holding elections every single year in which they cheat every single time. But the opposition don't have the sufficient leverage to participate in these elections and make a difference. And we just did. We won with more than 67% of the votes. If we had... If we had done the opposite of putting more pressures, more sanctions, it was way easier for them to just as they, they did with Maria Corina to disqualify the opposition candidate and we didn't participate at all. And that didn't happen. I don't know, man. For, for me, all of this feels like participation trophies when we really want the real trophy, which is to overthrow the regime and to keep releasing these people who are criminals instead of one, enforcing American laws, by the way. I mean, in order to get away of the American law, Biden had to grant presidential clemency to these people. Uh, so all of this was outside, you know, he had to exercise his, I guess, constitutional pardon powers in order to to get around this. And and it's just sad to me, um, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not saying I have the solution. I'm, you know, Cesar, I'm, you know, none of us really do, does. But um, yeah, I, I it, it's a sad status quo. I mean, Daniel, you're basically making the case that the U.S. just got played by Maduro. Right. Yes. Oh, but, but Maduro has played everyone. They have played sure. the opposition. Sure. They have played the U.S. And in fact, the whole reason Maria Corina Machado got elected in the primaries is because she's the candidate that has refused to negotiate with Maduro for 25 years. But so the thing that I'm curious about is what should the U.S. do now to respond? Right. Like, surely this can't just stand. Right. This idea of like coming to the negotiating table and fulfilling your end of the bargain and then watching uh, the other party's end of the bargain be completely, completely violated. 
you know, blatantly, flagrantly violated? Like, what should the U.S. do to respond? To yeah, that? I mean, uphold this. I was today in the National Security Council. If I, if, if you know, I have had the choice of do whatever I want, I would number one re- reinstate all the sanctions that were lifted, among them the secondary sanctions, meaning no foreign company can do business with the Maduro regime. A lot of people will say, oh, you're hurting the people of Venezuela. That is false. You can travel to Venezuela. You can send money. I do it myself. You can send food. You can send anything. The thing you can't is to do business with people who are part of the regime. I think that's totally fair and that should be the the piece. Um, And then uh, after that, I would start criminal investigations against anybody who has ever received any money from the Maduro regime. I mean, right now, did you know that the president of the People's Forum here in New York City, one of the organizations that organized the Palestine protests, is with Maduro hanging out? Who paid for that trip to Venezuela? If, if the Maduro regime is involved in any way in this, that's violating U.S. sanctions. Why isn't there an FBI investigation or criminal investigation on this? Why aren't there criminal investigations in Spain of the people tied with the regime? The U.S. should pressure Spain to investigate these people, confiscate their assets, I'm not talking about any country invading any country here. I'm talking about enforcing laws against transnational criminals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I want to take us along to something that's been kind of disturbing that we've seen an awful lot from the Western media. Basically, you know, a lot of parts of the far left um, who consider themselves anti-imperialists say that the Western imperialists, especially like those in the media, are lying about all of this. Um, One of my great hobbies for the past week has been watching Democracy Now! clips, which contains a shocking amount of uh, Maduro side taking. Uh, Maybe not shocking if you're a regular viewer of Democracy Now!, but there's a certain amount of like, it feels like you're watching down is up, up is down, like some sort of topsy-turvy funhouse mirror warped idea of the world. It's really interesting. Uh, But I want to play an example from a, a fairly large leftist account called Breakthrough News. John, could you roll that clip? The media is lying to you about Venezuela. For months, the opposition said they'd only respect the election results if they won. And sure enough, they immediately said the election was fraudulent after they lost. So what's their evidence? The opposition is claiming that they already have three quarters of the paper ballots collected, but they haven't actually produced any of them. So until that happens, it's just talk. Another talking point the media has been running with is this exit poll that allegedly shows Edmundo Gonzalez winning by over 30%. The only problem with this? The polling firm they're citing is basically an arm of the US government. The polling firm Edison Research counts among its top clients Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, all of which are US state-owned media that were created to disseminate pro-US messaging in their respective regions. They all work under the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which is a U.S. government agency, and its website says that the media outlets serve, quote, the long-range interests of the United States. Exit polling is also illegal in Venezuela, so they did this outside the law with no way of cross-checking it. U.S. policy towards Venezuela has been incredibly hostile for the last 20 years, so it's hard to believe that a polling firm whose whole business model is based on conducting polls for U.S. state media would suddenly turn out a poll completely contradicting the U.S. narrative. But by far the most telling aspect of all this is that the Venezuelan opposition said they weren't going to recognize the election results way before the election even started. Venezuela's electoral authority is supposed to have 72 hours to release the full results, but the opposition decided within one hour to declare it illegitimate, and within 12 hours they were staging an insurrection. The U.S. did the same thing too. Almost immediately after votes started being tallied, Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, immediately tried to cast doubt on the election results. This begs the question, how could U.S. officials have known their position on the election before it was even finished? And the answer is, they already had their minds made up. They were going to declare the election fraudulent no matter what. So, Daniel, you look like you're in a world of pain. Why don't you bring us into that world of pain? My my blood is boiling because these people are really evil, Liz. Um, You know, I understand people who are lied to and they believe lies without information, but this specific man is not, uh, is not lied to, he's the one lying to people. And, and that makes my blood boil because Venezuela is the largest refugee crisis that is not caused by a war, by a war uh, in world history. I don't understand if people can grasp the size of this, but a quarter of the population of a country living means every single family has lost somebody. Uh, um, over a quarter of a million people in Venezuela in the last 25 years have been murdered through regular homicide 
people have lost their lives because of lack of medicine and food. Uh, this regime doesn't have popular support. I would encourage anybody who believes these things to talk to random Venezuelans. Go to the shelters here in New York City like I have and ask those people, why, why did they leave Venezuela? Are all these people just evil CIA agents? Did the CIA recruit 8 million people for us to lie all together at the same time? What, if, if the CIA did that, I don't think Maduro would still be in power. The CIA was capable of doing that. The way that they are making that case is always dropping these breadcrumbs and showing the graphs of the different NGOs that give money to the opposition groups. And in their defense, you know, there it, there's the endowment for democracy. That's uh, that gets money from the State Department, I believe. And you can connect dots there and find some thousands or tens of thousands of dollars that have gone to some of these groups. Um, does that mean that this is all a, you know, U.S. operation, you know, U.S. funded color revolution or something like that? Um, well, what I would say is right now it's actually a very precarious in, uh, environment in Venezuela for NGOs because the regime has been trying to ban all NGOs. Um, has you know they they stopped even humanitarian aid from entering Venezuela because they thought that that was a U.S. conspiracy sending food, right? Um, it's kind of like the whole story. These are the same people who say we should send humanitarian aid to Gaza, but then if they reject it, then oh, it's the America's fault. It's not the fault of the of the regime in power. Um, look, I mean, it's just a lie. Um, he mentioned about how the opposition collected the tallies. I think Cesar explained this very well at the beginning. Um, the reality is that we have recordings of every voting precinct that you can imagine, even on video announcing the results of their voting precinct. So we know, even without the physical evidence, the night result in each voting precinct. And they're, they're, my favorite video is one voting precinct where this lady says the number of votes for Edmundo, then somebody says, and how many votes got the you know expletive Maduro? Um, and they said zero and everybody starts cheering because he had zero votes, imagine in a voting center. Um, and so we don't believe the results because they are false. Imagine how false they are that they rounded perfectly to 51.200000%. I made the numbers, it's one in 100 million, the chances that all the numbers, not just of Maduro, but of the opposition candidate and of all the other candidates round to zero after the first decimal. It's impossible to be that exact. But Cesar, what about this last point he's making where he's saying, what, well, Anthony Blinken was already calling it a fraudulent election before the voting or b before the votes were even counted. They already they were planning this all along. Um, they had their mains, minds made up from the beginning. Yeah, you need to connect that with the opposition's announcements. Like, if you have data, if you have polls, if you have a lot of resources that could tell you the opposition is going to win by a large margin, because this was not a close election at all. The opposition won by a difference of millions of votes, something like 20 or 30% of, of, of the difference. Uh, you understand that if the opposition or if the announcement of the results is not giving the opposition the victory, something's bad with those results. And the evidence is all published, it's all online. This is not this is not about like a political narrative or anything like that. Uh, but I would say that uh, the US government didn't have a, an official uh, statement about the results of the elections, not hours, but days after the election, uh, the announcement were made by the Venezuelan government and also because uh, it took time for the opposition to collect all these tallies and, tallies and publish it. Uh, they claim at the beginning that they had 73% of the tallies, uh, but the website was launched two days after the election, and that's where all the international media, all the governments, etc., were able to certify and verify those results and verify, verify all the data that, that is online that says that it's impossible that Maduro won. E even if the opposition has more than 80% of the tallies right now, something like 81, 82%, if Maduro got 100% of the rest of the tallies that are not in the system, it's mathematically impossible for him to win. An another line of argumentation you often hear from the Western left, uh, American left, is that 
this is all because of sanctions. Um, This is all because the U.S. has sanctioned Venezuela into poverty. It's also, of course, a line you hear from Maduro and heard from Chavez himself all the time. Um, We have another clip from that same uh, video that I want to play that makes that argument. I'd like to know what you all think of that. Antony Blinken, Marco Rubio, and all the other war criminals that have been managing and overseeing the genocide in Palestine didn't suddenly wake up one day and realize that they care so deeply about the little boys and girls in Venezuela. In fact, the U.S. government is currently enforcing a sanctions regime that's estimated to have killed at least 100,000 people in Venezuela through manufactured poverty and scarcity. U.S. sanctions against Venezuela's oil sector, which is its primary source of income, caused the oil sector to collapse and the subsequent decrease of government income by 99%. So yes, the poverty and scarcity you hear about is very real, but it's caused by U.S. sanctions, which have forced Venezuelans to live off 1% of their pre-sanctions income. This is also what's behind the wave of Venezuelan migration that you hear about on the news. It all comes back to this policy of manufactured poverty. If the United States actually cared about the well-being of Venezuelans, they wouldn't be strangling the Venezuelan economy to the point where there are shortages of fuel and medicine. In fact, the United States tends to be the most violent when it feigns humanitarian concern. They manufacture social crises and then use it as an excuse for regime change. The U.S. has a long history of supporting these color revolutions. When they know they can't directly invade a country, they create a social crisis to undermine it. And now they're doing the same thing to Venezuela. Don't fall for it this time. I mean, this is just shocking on so many levels, right? Like it's it's disturbing thinking that any leftist in America could be kind of swindled into believing something like this, especially because these sanctions weren't placed on Venezuela out of nowhere, right? Like none of nothing in this video even begins to gesture at well why did those sanctions get put in place and and you know what was the instigating event or factor and for how long has this been going on uh what are other things that you think that um say say, you know you're an american leftist and you watch videos like that and you begin to believe them daniel and cesar what are the things that you would say that person ought to be asking i i think first people use the word sanction broadly what is a sanction they don't it's kind of like when they say deregulation is bad regulation is good like what specific regulation? What specific policy? Like, let's get into the details. These people can't even name what sanctions there are in Venezuela. Let's begin. What sanctions are there? They froze the accounts of Maduro, his bank accounts, the accounts of the Estado Cabello, the accounts of other members of the regime. That did not affect anybody but those actual criminals, uh, not Marco Rubio, who is obviously not a war criminal. He was never. He is, hasn't been in a war that I know of. Um, so... That, that obviously doesn't affect the people. What other sanctions are there? That you can't trade Venezuelan government debt. Uh, that's one of the other sanctions. You can't lend money to the Venezuelan government. You can lend money to Venezuelan citizens. There's no restriction on it. Uh, there, you can't before, now you can. Uh, before, during the Trump administration, you couldn't import Venezuelan oil to the U.S. Who owns the Venezuelan oil industry? The government. You could do anything with Venezuelans. I said money. There are companies here in the U.S. that send food door to door in Venezuela. You can send that there. This is there is no embargo on Venezuela like there is on Cuba. I think there is another argument to be made. Like, well, maybe sanctions in Cuba actually hurt somewhat the population. But but in Venezuela, there's no such thing. You can travel. There's no restrict. I wouldn't encourage you to travel for your own safety, but you're allowed. Um, and so, th- this is all a myth. Uh, And also, even if those sanctions were in place, like in Cuba, like in Iran, 99% of your income is lost because of sanctions. Do you think the U.S. really has that much power over another economy? If we did, why do you, how could Russia still fight in Ukraine if we could reduce the Russian income by 99% with a stroke of a pen? I wish the U.S. had that power. Maybe Ukraine wouldn't have been invaded. Maybe the world would be very different. Um, so, so all of this is a myth. Um, Iran is the best example. It's the most heavily sanctioned economy in the world. Why isn't there hyperinflation in Iran? Why aren't there millions of Iranians fleeing to Turkey? Women have no rights in Iran. People get hanged even for protesting the anthem. I would argue Iran is much more totalitarian than Venezuela. So why aren't there more Iranians fleeing? Because Iran is not a socialist country. It's that simple. And before addressing that point, 
I'll say that uh, in last week, especially, a lot of people in social media from Venezuela have been giving this a nickname of Venezuela explaining to so all these explanations from people, especially from the American left, to other Venezuelans, to people like Daniel, like me, like, hey, this is what actually happened in your country, not what you believe, not what you saw in your country. This is my explanation. And it's really funny because I, I, I think in the whole rhetoric of denouncing uh, colonialism, imperialism, etc., they are pretty much acting like that when you, they want to explain the situation. Uh, or, or a situation that is not uh, known from for them to people that are, are actually fled from those realities. If you go to Caracas or, or the big cities in Venezuela, uh, you can find the same products that you can buy here at Costco, for example. Uh, you can find the, these Kirkland products. You can find everything there. And, and a lot of products are being actively imported from the U.S. to, to Venezuela to these uh, bodegones, which are like... Uh, grocery stores of mostly from people uh, that are politically connected to the government so they, ha they, have, they have the opportunity to to engage in free trade and everything if you're obviously connected to the government so uh, to Daniel's point the problem in Venezuela is not about US sanctions it's about a government that restricted freedom and liberties to everyone but if you're well connected you can pretty much live a good life over there. The thing that's really shocking to me about this is just like there's an entire industry that sprung up of all of these um, anti-imperialist, uh, smarter than the rest of you leftists who are saying they know the real truth. And yet, to me, this just directly contradicts <laughs> pretty much everything I've ever heard from any Venezuelan who actually escaped. Uh, like, to me, this just doesn't pass a basic sniff test of like, well, wait a second, why would this person in a collared shirt in this well-produced high production value video be telling me this thing? that's just completely different than literally everything else I've ever heard. Is there anything that explains why the American left has such a vested stake in spreading that type of narrative? I think there's historically been on the American left a very anti-American uh, sentiment, meaning uh, the U.S. is at fault for everything bad that happens in the world, which is also a very egocentric sentiment because you think that everything has to do with you when the reality is that most of the things that happen around the world have nothing to do with the United States. Like people are independent and they think independently outside of the United States. These people need to understand uh, the U.S. isn't really involved in all these things. Um, and, and bad things and good things happen that have nothing to do with America. And so I, I think people need to take a step back and, and actually maybe learn about the experience of Venezuela rather than lecture and see how can a country go democratically from one of the richest countries in the world to one of the poorest. Maybe that's something we can learn about so that we don't repeat it here. And one of the I things feel, that yeah. people tend to forget is that Chavez was a rock star for the American left. People like Michael Moore, like Sean Penn, uh, Jamie Foxx, and a lot of uh, actors and people from Hollywood were huge fans of Hugo Chavez. They constantly visited him. And after Chavez died, they continued visiting Venezuela, visiting Maduro, uh, inviting, for example, Chavez to red carpets, to these fancy Hollywood events and uh, stuff like that. So uh, at some point, it looks like Venezuela was an experiment for the ideas that the American left have for America. And these same things that they claim to, to, to want for their own country, it's, they are the same things that made us left our country massively. So I, I, I don't know, but they, they, it's just a sad reality. And, and at some point, it's really sad to see all these people trying to explain your reality to you. I feel like the legend of Chavez is still alive in the minds of a lot of the, the these folks and in the and as well as media people who write about Venezuela. I felt a little bit Venice Venezuela explained or whatever however you put it Cesar by the New York Times when they were uh, describing how this all went down. Uh, this was the article about the the initial article they published about the election. Venezuela's autocrat is declared winner in tainted election. And uh, if you scroll down in the story, they explain to us that if this election decision holds and Mr. Maduro remains in power, he will carry Chavismo, the country's socialist inspired movement, into its third decade in Venezuela, founded by former president Hugo Chavez. Mr. Maduro's mentor, the movement initially promised to lift millions out of poverty. 
for a time it did. But in recent years, the socialist model has given way to brutal capitalism, economists mm -hmm. say, with a small state connected minority controlling much of the nation's wealth. So it's quite a shame. Real socialism, again, has never been tried. Um, yeah. Do you think it can work somewhere else, Daniel? You know, when, when socialism fails, it's capitalism. Uh, uh, that it's never succeeded. They can't find an example, even when it's been democratically uh, implemented as it was in Venezuela at the start. Look, obviously, uh, a lot of people forget, obviously, poverty was temporarily reduced at the beginning of the Chavez years because oil revenues multiplied times more than 10 uh, in his first uh, six years in power. So it's hard when government revenues increase sixfold in real terms not to reduce poverty. The real tragedy was that poverty was not eradicated and the country didn't become like Dubai. That's what should have happened in Venezuela if it was a free country. We really, I shouldn't be here and neither should Cesar. We should be in Caracas driving Lamborghinis. That, that's <laughs> what Venezuela would be like if Venezuela was a proper free country with all the oil revenues it got. So, and instead, we all had to flee our homeland, 8 million people. So, so we lost uh, all of that. And now these people say it's brutal capitalism just because they lifted price controls, which, by the way, was a consequence of U.S. sanctions, one of the good consequences. They adopted the U.S. dollar because they destroyed our currency. So now most transactions are in U.S. dollars. But most of the economy is still nationalized. The oil sector is government-owned. All utilities are government-owned. Most banks, uh, all the manufacturing, cement, many grocery stores are government-owned. If that is brutal capitalism, then North Korea must be a relatively free and, f and free economy, right? Uh, like, I, I don't understand then what, what is, like, if that is brutal capitalism, what is the U.S.? Like, are we an anarch anarcho-capitalism here? What, what, is, what are we here? I like the idea of your entire career, Daniel, being motivated by, um, you know, love of your country, but also extreme upset, like, you know, a, a sense of disgust that you're not currently driving around Caracas in a Lamborghini <laughs> with all of your friends, right? Like, I like that idea. I'm going to keep that vision of you in my head. Um, Cesar, what say you? Are you a brutal capitalist? Uh, I am, but that was definitely another. <laughs> reality, so that's, that's another. That's a topic for another episode. <laughs> yeah, but but I took some time to uh, read through this New York Times article, and the report that they point they link in uh, in that article is from 2020, and it's basically a report when they went to certain places in Caracas, in the capital city, and they went to luxurious restaurants, luxurious bars. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of like parties with a uh, Prada and Chanel bags and shoes. And, and they saw a lot of wealth in a supposedly destroyed country, in a country where everyone is impoverished. Uh, but at the same time, they had the chance to go to the outskirts of the capital city in Caracas, to go to uh, but, uh, neighborhoods like Petare, where most of the uh, working class people live in. So uh, at the same time, they are able to draw this distinction between the small politically connect majority that has access to importations. They are the same people that runs these bodegones or they have Costco products in even uh, somehow evading the US sanctions and the blockade and all the things that the left uh, claims about Venezuela. So there's definitely pockets of wealth within the country, just as you can find pockets of wealth in Pyongyang, in North Korea. But that's not the reality at all. And if you are able to left Caracas and stop it, like pointing everything on the capital and go to other regions, for example, the state where I grew up in, in the border between Venezuela and Colombia, we had to deal with a hard reality over there. People uh, are not only dealing with price controls, with regulations, with the government, but we were also dealing with armed uh, criminal organizations like uh, guerrillas from Colombia, paramilitary groups uh, that were born to control uh, all these passages in the border between uh, these countries. So I, I can just add one more thing. And it's when, when people say that uh, Venezuela stopped being like obsessed with socialism and stopped imposing price controls, et cetera, it's not because suddenly Maduro uh, understood that socialism was not a good idea and capitalism is the way to go, but mostly because he just ran out of power to enforce those laws because people were re actively rejecting to enforce price controls that they knew because they experimented it 
uh, that were driving scarcity to this higher level. So they just ran out of power to enforce social laws, And that's the space where uh, some part of the Venezuelan economy uh, has been improved, but not because the government wanted it, but because they were not able to impose socialism anymore. Mm. Yeah, You know, the strange thing about the, about the way the New York Times frames that, or we see it framed all the time, is that the corruption is not in any way related to the socialism, that it's unfortunate that these corrupt people like Maduro got into power and are enriching themselves, but that doesn't really have much to do with socialism. Is that your experience, Cesar, from observing it play out in Venezuela? Not at all. I would like to point to a case. Uh, there was this farmer called Franklin Brito. Uh, he was a farmer in Venezuela, but his property was uh, taken by the government because he resisted price controls because it was impossible for him to keep producing at the rates that the government centrally, centrally planned and told him to produce. And uh, instead of receiving the compensation for his property, he decided to went on a hunger strike. He ended up dying on that hunger strike. Uh, so it's yeah. definitely, like, there's a lot of stories like this of people that lost uh, all their belongings, probably uh, the world that their families built to multiple generations. Uh, and it's just part of the sad reality that we're living. What's one question both of you think more people should be asking? I think um, more people should be thinking how do we not create the conditions in America that led to the election of Chavez? Because that's the risk for us. Like, what were the conditions that led Venezuelans to vote for somebody who a lot of people who were well-informed knew could become a dictator like Hugo Chavez? And I think those conditions were really that the economy in the late 90s in Venezuela were wasn't very good. I mean, Venezuela was still the wealthiest country in Latin America by far, but but it had stagnated for a couple of decades since oil nationalization. And I think it was the weight of the state that stagnated the economy in Venezuela that led people to say, I am done with this system and I want to vote for somebody who's going to tear it apart and is going to give me all these free things and, and I'm willing to take a risk. And that risk, unfortunately, uh, you know, now you can't take them out democratically. So uh, we need to keep America free uh, as in not just politically free, but economically free so that people prosper and they never feel the need to vote for somebody that is going to use the government to solve all their problems. I will add that people should be asking why do we care about Venezuela? And it might be a question that comes from like any background. There's people that just say that ironically, like, I don't care about Venezuela. Why should I care about these countries? It's not my country. I don't deal with the consequences of what's happening. Uh, miles away from my house or my state or whatever. But in reality, uh, the U.S., uh, just as, as Daniel mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, has a role in, in, in all this situation or could, be, or could have a role more significant to help a lot of people that, I mean, we literally don't have any tools to do this from ourselves. We don't have any guns in Venezuela. The opposition is not armed. The civilians are not armed. Uh, and this is this was because of government decisions in the past. So if if you just believe that America is the whole world and whatever happens outside America doesn't matter, you will end up with the situation like millions or, or well, thousands of migrants coming to the border, seeking a better life, and you don't even understand why are they here? Are they fleeing for some for something? Do they have a right to be here? Are they going to? move here to to start businesses or or whatever so i think definitely the question of why should i care about this will be presented way more in in, in society to have a more civic debate about all this stuff and definitely ask venezuelans about it thank you both for coming on the show thank you thanks for having me thanks for listening to just asking questions these conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.